Okay, we are live. So what's up everybody? This is Ray and welcome to our monthly tech talk for September 2014. This is our 14th free tech talk and this month tutorial team member Chris Wagner is going to give a tech talk on iOS 8 app extensions. App extensions are an exciting new feature that allows you to provide extra functionality in your apps to other apps in iOS, even apps you don't own like stock Apple apps. It's pretty groundbreaking and you can do some pretty cool things with it, so Chris is here to tell you all about it. So here's today's schedule. First, Chris is going to give you a talk on iOS 8 app extensions and give you a cool demo about some of the things you can do with it. And then we'll open things up to Q&A. So if you're watching this live, you can submit any questions you might have with the Q&A tool and upvote other people's questions. After Chris goes through his talk and demo, we'll go through your questions based on those with the most upvotes. So before we get started, let me tell you a little bit more about Chris Wagner. Chris is a tutorial team member on our site, and he's a co-author of iOS 6 and iOS 7 by Tutorials. In iOS 8 by Tutorials, he wrote several chapters on app extensions, specifically action extensions, photo editing extensions, share extensions, and today extensions. And so he's basically gone through the school of hard knocks with these extensions so that you guys don't have to. Chris is the lead developer at Infusionsoft, and he's been building apps for their flagship web product. And as for hobbies, he's one of those workaholic types, like many of us here, who his work is his hobby. So now I'll turn it over to Chris, who will give you a talk about iOS 8 app extensions. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about this because this is exciting stuff. Apple really kind of surprised us at the developer conference this year and opened up the the APIs so that we can do a lot of neat things. So uh, let's just start the, the slideshow here. Let me share my screen. Okay. Are we good, Ray? That looks good. Right. So what we're going to talk about is we're going to first dive into a user perspective. So what does an app extension look like for the user? And I think that's a good starting point because it's going to give us that drive to do do these things for the user. Like we want to, we're going to see how it's how it is going to be to experience app extensions from a user's standpoint. And then, really, as a developer, you're going to be like, okay, now I want to do this, this, and that. So we're going to go over each type. Uh, we're going to go over how how they get installed and what it what it means to manage extensions. We'll take a look at. Every, a demo, a small demo for a couple of, of extensions that have been announced by other developers. And then we'll jump into the developer perspective, get into the technicals of what actually is an extension, how you create them, a high-level overview of the life cycle of an app extension, and then we can go into the Q&A. Uh, we'll also uh, squeeze in a little bit of a, a code sample demo there where I'll jump into Xcode and show you our widget extension that's going to be in the iOS 8 by Tutorials book. All right. So the first step, we have widgets. Uh, technically, they're, they're called Today extensions because they live inside of the Today section of the Notification Center. But Apple calls them widgets. Everybody calls them widgets. So I call them widgets. But Today extensions, from a developer perspective, is what you would call them. Um, so this really redefines the notification center, and Apple's given away uh, the, the control as, as to what shows up here. No longer do they decide what's important to you. You get to appear. You get to decide what appears in here, what order it appears. You can rearrange these from a top-down level. Um, and then here in this this screenshot here, we see what Apple demonstrated during their keynote, which is a sports center app that shows uh, your favorite team's scores or upcoming games. In this case, it says that the Athletics are playing the Blue Jays on May 23rd, and it shows their, their records as well. So you, this is kind of a real um, succinct view into your app's data. So if your app uh, is, a, is a sports app, you can pull out the function, some of the small bits of functionality that the user might find interesting at a glance notice. So if they pull out their iPhone, uh, they want to see when, when the upcoming game is. They just hit the home button and swipe down Notification Center, and, and there they are. They can see data from your app. So this is pretty powerful. It's, it's, it's the quickest way for users to get value from your application. 
And next up, we've got share extensions. Uh, these ones have been around, actually, in iOS for a while in a, in a certain way. So Apple has defined these share extensions for things like Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn, where if you're browsing a website in Safari, you can press that share button and then share it to your Facebook feed or post a tweet about it. Well, what is that? So, what, so what's actually different here? Um, and what's different is now you get to define what service is included in that list of destinations. So no longer do we have to wait for Apple's yearly release cycle to get the latest social networking app uh, baked into the OS as a first-class integration. Now you, as a service owner, so if you, um, if you have your own social network or you have maybe a messaging app, you can expose a share extension through your app, and then users can upload content directly to that from, let's say, the Photos app in this case. That's what this screenshot we're seeing here is, um, and a number of other apps. So if there's another app that happens to manage photos or pictures, those can expose that, that share button and allow the user to share that content to any service that says, hey, I support uh, the, the sharing of photos or any other content that you define. So this, this brought a question to my mind was, what does this mean for those first-class social integrations like Facebook and Twitter? Um, I don't know what the future of those are. At this point, it seems that they're still controlled by Apple and they're still baked into the OS, but I'm hoping to see that that control is relinquished over to the, the companies so that Facebook can modify that share extension so that it, it's up to date with their, uh, with their product. So if there's a new feature that you can do on the Facebook website or the Facebook app, uh, theoretically they could now um, push releases throughout the year before the next update of iOS so you get uh, the, the most up-to-date experience through these, these tight integrations with the operating system. So this example here, we've got uh, just a photo sharing through, if you, if you notice the green icon in the, in the, in the options there, uh, we're, we're uploading an, an image straight to imager.com. And this is another extension that you would learn to write in iOS 8 by tutorials. So prepare your social feeds because cats and food are coming. People are going to be sharing these pictures like crazy. All right, next up are action extensions, and these are my personal favorite. I kind of for these, foresee these as changing the way that we use iOS, and part of the reason is that is they're very vague. There's no defined path for them. Apple's kind of left it open for your interpretation to say what, what these action extensions can do. So there's, just, there's, there's room for trailblazers to, to wow us to see what, um, what, what they're going to provide. I'm, I'm really excited for tomorrow to see all the apps hit the App Store with these types of extensions. Um, in this example, we're, uh, we're browsing in Safari. We're, we're checking out the, the DevCon site, um, so the little plug there. <laughs> but in, in this case, I wanted to uh, shorten that URL and send it off to, through a tweet or something like that. So I press the share button, and then down in the bottom half of the, the share sheet, there's these actions, and you'll see one called QuickerBit. And what that does is when you press that, it's going to shorten the URL of the current website through bit.ly.com's API, and then it's going to uh, display that URL to you. Um, and then also, ideally, it's going to copy it to your clipboard so that you can quickly share that. So this, this seems like a pretty basic idea, and it's not like, at first, it, it doesn't really seem that impressive. But when I, this is, again, another extension that uh, I wrote about in the book. And when I actually used it after I got it working, I, I was just so impressed how fast you can shorten a URL now in iOS. Before you had to jump to another app or jump to a different website. Now you, it's, it's literally two taps. You tap the share button, you tap the quicker bit button, and you've got a shortened URL. It's really pretty amazing. So um, Apple de demonstrated another one of these in their, in their keynote, and it was where they were translating the language of the current page. So they were, they were browsing a web page, and they go to the, the share button or the action button, and they pressed a Bing Translate button. And immediately you saw the content on the page change from one language to another. And it was really impressive. So through these action extensions in Safari specifically, you get control over the content of the page. Let's talk a little more. Are we, 
the, the book talks a lot more about this, but you can actually use JavaScript and, and manipulate the page and get data from the page when that, that extension is invoked. So I'm really, really excited about these ones. Uh, again, these are my personal favorites. I think it's going to be awesome. And I, I just can't wait to see how developers, for lack of a better word, abuse these things. It's going to be really interesting to see how Apple approaches the review process, because I think that these really open the floodgates. And then we have photo editing. So photo editing is a little bit, is probably one of the most constrained ones. It, it allows you to inject your photo editing capabilities in the Photos app, and that's it. It's not, a, it's not something that, um, let's say you have a photo editing app and you want to, let's say you've got, yeah, let's just say you've got a, another, you, your own photo editing app and you want to allow, or you want to take advantage of some other uh, competitors' editing capabilities within your app. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case for these. These ones are specific to Apple's photo app. So when a user is browsing their pictures, um, like before in iOS 7, they can tap that edit button and then um, start manipulating the picture. Well, now there's another button where they tap and then they get a list of all the, uh, the providers for who can edit a photo. So this, I think this is going to bring some new apps to the App Store or really showcase some that we didn't know of before. Because now you don't really have to rely on this you don't have to switch between 10 different photo apps to, to do things like creating memes. Um, now you can write in the Photos app, just hit edit, pick that editor, and then, and then go, go on your way, make the edits, and hit save. But best of all, the photo apps now supports revisions. So never again will you get fired for putting a ridiculous mustache on your boss. You can always just revert back to the original um, and, keep, and then and go on your way. Uh, the, there's also extra support for the photo editing extension itself. When the photo editing app invokes you, they tell you all of the changes that you did before if you supply them. So that you can actually provide an undo stack. Uh, this app here just has some filters, so you can apply different, like Instagram filters for. The next one is document provider, and this is this is kind of weird. Apple's basically brought a file management interface to iOS, and that was kind of a an area that it felt like they didn't ever want to do. But as we know, as a user, it's important. Sometimes you need to access files at different locations. So now you have the ability to, um, in one app, access the files of another app, so or another service. So in this example here on the right, we see this is the Pages app. And the user has um, tried to add a new document. They, they click that plus button, and this action sheet comes up. And it allows them to create the document from, from scratch or pick from a number of sources, things like iCloud documents, box.com, OneDrive, and iTunes and WebDev. So how does this work? If we're in this app and we're reading files from another one, I mean, what does that mean? Well, there's a couple of, of ways that you as a developer decide how uh, documents are, are managed between apps. Uh, you can choose to import that file, so you get a, a, a copy of it that you're going to modify inside of your own sandbox, which is you could kind of do that before in iOS 7 um, through some other means. Or you can export it to that service. So let's say I want to take a copy of this file and put it in my, my Dropbox. You can do that. Um, and then also you can actually edit the files directly in that uh, in that container. So if I if I open up this this pages document from box.com, if they allow it, I can edit make edits directly into box.com and then hit, and then save and jump out, and my changes will be across all of my computers because it's synced up. Um, this is obviously dependent on the providers. So if you have any kind of cloud storage providing capabilities, um, you might want to look into this. So this this will be this will be good. And lastly, the last type of extension is a keyboard. So Apple's literally handed over the keys in iOS. As a developer now, you can provide custom keyboards. And here we see um, this example is from Swipe, and they've actually been on Android for some time. But it allows you to type by 
using these swipe gestures. So you, you drag your finger from one letter to the next in a single swoop. So then rather than punching individual keys, you kind of just get these motions down. So if you, if you want to type hello, I imagine, I've never used this myself, I'm excited to try it out, but I imagine you get this muscle memory where you're kind of just, you, you, you start understanding these, uh, these swipe gestures that you're making. And then it's got some really advanced technology to determine which word you might have meant by doing that. Um, and as usual, Apple has considered security and privacy here along the way. So by the very nature, a keyboard could log your keystrokes, and that's, that's concerning. So by default, these, um, these keyboard extensions cannot access the internet, and they, they can't do certain things with their, their container app. So they can't capture your keystrokes and send them someplace that you're not aware of, or even send them back to you. Nobody, uh, uh, they're basically locked in. So that's, that's kind of reassuring. But that does limit the functionality of them. They, they can't do certain things like maybe download a new key set from the internet or um, some other dynamic information. So if you, if you really trust the developer, you can grant permission to extra things like access to the internet or um, talking to its container app. So it's really just a, it's on, on your best judgment if, if you trust the developer before handing over that permission. But they also, Apple has also restricted custom keyboards so that they, they'll never appear or be an option on a password field or a phone number field. So if you're typing in a password, you'll always get Apple's keyboard, so at least you, you'll know that your passwords are never being um, keystroked or logged, the keystrokes are being logged. And then also phone numbers, I think it's a restriction with telecoms where they have a, a strict set of entries into uh, the phone dialer, so Apple's restricted those fields as well. And if you happen to develop an app that has a lot of privacy regulations, maybe it's a, it's a health care app and you've got some HIPAA regulations that you have to follow, you as that developer can disable third-party apps across your app entirely. Or, sorry, third-party keyboards across your app entirely. So if, if, if you're just, if you, if you want to take that security step on, on behalf of your user to say you shouldn't trust any custom keyboard in our app, maybe it's a, it's a banking app as well, and there's a lot of private data there, really sensitive data. Um, you, you as a developer can say, no, we don't allow custom keyboards for your, for your benefit, security benefit. Okay. So one of the first act uh, questions I asked myself was, how are extensions installed and delivered? And they, like, it's like, is this a, another section in the App Store where I go and download these things? Um, no, it's not. These are, these are baked into, the, into your apps. So you have um, your, your app as you have today, and if you want to add an extension to it, you would simply create a new target, and then um, that will get included uh, bundled up with your app when the app is installed for the user. So there's no separate installation. You're not going to search out specifically for extensions, at least I don't think you will. You're going to search for, you're going to find out that things like um, uh, maybe Path, the, the social networking app, has a share extension in it, and you're going to, you're going to use it that, that way. Uh, the one caveat is custom keyboards. Those kind of, I think that there's going to be a lot of apps out there that are just specifically a custom keyboard. There's no, I don't think there's very many apps out there right now that are providing keyboards just for the sake of having a keyboard within their app. I know there's a few of them, but... Um, those ones you're going to probably seek out specifically for the extension. Uh, by default, these things are disabled. So if you install an app that has an extension, you're not going to see it automatically appear in your share sheets. Um, there will be a, a, a button as you scroll across and past your extension or your your icons in there that says more, where you can configure what shows up in that sheet in which order. So you you as a user get to decide when it shows up, where it shows up, or if it shows up at all. And that's at any given point. There's no, no final action for that. All right, so from a de developer perspective, um, sorry, that's not right. We're going to do demos right now. <laughs> so let's, let's take a look at these demos. So these are, I, I picked out a few that I saw um, come across Twitter or just in some blog posts to show you guys that there's some companies out there that are ready to go day one. They're going to release these, these extensions. And this one's a custom keyword extension. 
that actually is a, it's a bunch of like, GIF images. So if you want to send some snarky response to your friend and messengers and messaging, you can switch to this keyboard, uh, find a categorized GIF image, and then uh, you the way it works for them is you copy and paste this thing into into the message uh, body. So you can quickly send little funny animations to your friends. Uh, this next one is Things. So Things is a pop popular. Uh, you basically create a list, kind of like reminders, and you you manage that in the app. Well, they've announced they're they're releasing a um, an action extension, and what it does is when you're when you're browsing in this case, that somebody somebody's browsing in Safari and they've come across a recipe they want to try. Normally, what you would have to do in iOS today is you would either copy the URL, jump over to Things, and say, "Hey." Uh, try this recipe out, add it to your reminder list, or you copy the body of the, the the recipe so that you have the instructions within things. Well, now let's watch this video and see how you do it. So they're on this website. They tap, they scroll through here. Uh, they select what they're interested in. Rather than copying, they tap that share button, and then they say add to things. And now this things interface pops up. It's got the content that they selected, in the description of the task, and they've titled the task, tap try new recipe, they tap save, and they're done. They're back in Safari. So they've never left Safari. And this extension appeared right here within Safari, and they've got this thing on their things list now. Pretty powerful. And, and this one's 1Password. So 1Password is one of my favorite apps, and I was really hoping that they would figure out how to make an extension work so that I can use 1Password within other apps, and they did it. They did it through an action extension. And they've done it in an interesting way so that you as a third-party developer can take this little library that they've developed, open source on GitHub, drop it into your app, and provide a 1Password button next to your sign-in fields. And when you tap that, uh, the share or the the, the action sheet comes up, and you pick one password, and it fills out your password. It's kind of like on the, br the browser extension on the web. So let's Hello, everyone. check this, this out. This one's got some audio. I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear it, but I'll let it play without me talking. Hello, everyone. This video shows you how easy it is to use one password to log into third-party apps. Here we have the Acme application. To log in, we simply tap the one password login button, select one password, unlock using Touch ID, select the login, and everything's filled for us. We can also fill into web pages as well. Here we have the Acme browser application. Go to Twitter, tap the one password login button, select one password, choose our login, and everything's filled for us automatically. So that's pretty awesome, right? You don't have to switch to one password, type in your passcode or your password, and you can authenticate with Touch ID now. That's another API that came out with iOS 8. Uh, and then Im immediately fill your password in. All right, so from a developer's perspective, what, is, what does this look like? Okay, so these are, uh, like I, said, I mentioned earlier, these are independent targets. So you're going to have your app that you have today in the App Store or in development, and you're going to add a new target to it. So when you add a new target, you're basically saying bundle this this extension with the app when I submit it to the App Store and when it's installed. When the, the the app that it's bundled with is called is known as a container app. So your extension is contained within within its within another app. And that's the app that is that that's functionality is being extended. When it's invoked, it's invoked by what is known as the host app. So that's, that's Say if we're we're talking about that one password one, or to make it simpler, we'll go back to Things. Things was the container app, and Safari was the host app. It's important to get these straight because these are the terms that Apple uses, and I think they're a little bit confusing because when you're inside, you, it kind of sounds like the container app is the one that's launching it because the extension's kind of contained inside of its runtime, but that's not the case. The container app is what the extension was shipped with. And then the host app is what invokes it. So 
the, the extension is contained with the container app, but it's not some kind of tightly coupled relationship. You can't directly share files between your extension and your container app, you, and you can't just reuse code willy-nilly um, across the two. They're, 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 they're going to run as separate processes, and they're, they're not going to be in the same space on the, on the, on the system. So you, you have to go through certain APIs and use certain frameworks to, to make that happen. So this isn't this isn't some kind of interprocess communication that Apple has opened up. Well, let's just look at the lifecycle a little bit of an, of an extension. So when the user is in the in the host app, they perform an action that invokes your extension, and then from there it's up to the system to launch your extension. So the system launches your extension, and usually some user interface is presented within the host app, and it's your user interface from your extension. At that point, your extension code runs. It does what it needs to do. The user interacts with it if, if there's any user interaction required. Um, and then they, they either do some action to say, I'm done, or if it's like a, the things extension, it, it kind of ran on its own, and it told the system when it was done. When it's done, it sends information back to the host app to say that it's done. And it might include some, some artifacts that it generated so that the host app can use those as well. Once that happens, the system actually kills your extension. So at that point, just the host app is running again. Your extension process has, has been killed. And throughout that entire time, uh, your container app wasn't, actually, wasn't required to be running. It may be running because it's got some resources. You just used it maybe. Um, the iOS multitasking system decides when apps are killed or not. But your container app is not required to run while your extension is running, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, there are a number of things that extensions don't have permission to do. And that includes a subset of the Cocoa and Cocoa Touch APIs. Um, they're, they're, they're mentioned in some of the guides to say which ones aren't available, specifically things like the app delegate. You can't access the app delegate. For one, the extension doesn't have an app delegate. And two, you can't access your container's app delegate, and you can't access your the host app's app delegate. Um, you can't access things like the camera or the microphone. You can't perform long running tasks, and you uh, won't be able to receive data through AirDrop. But to get a full picture of, of that life cycle, let's look at this chart here. Uh, right, right in the middle, we see uh, the app extension. Let's see if I get, oh, let's go back. I'm trying to get my pointer up. It's not going to show up. Okay, so right in the middle, we've got our app extension, and you'll see two lines going, two solid lines going to and from the host app, and those represent uh, the, the request received from the host app when the extension is invoked, and then the response that the, the extension sends back to the host app when it's done. So they kind of have this direct line of communication, but it's through a certain set of APIs. You can't define your own paths where you're constantly communi back, communicating back and forth. You're, you're going through Apple's specific APIs to talk to the host app. But most importantly, the app extension has absolutely no direct communication with its container app, and that seems a little strange. But I think that Apple's done that uh, in, or in order to, for, for with security in mind, so you can't have, you're basically, the app extension is not a channel for which a con one app can talk to another. Like I said earlier, there's, this isn't inter-process communication, and it's very easy to think that when you watch the keynote, it sounds like Apple has made it so two apps can talk to one another. Well, it's not exactly the case. If your app extension needs to talk to the container app, it can do that in a certain way through shared containers, and it does that through the security um, management of app groups. When I cr when you create an app group, you um, you define it's kind of like um, it's, it's it's like namespacing or keychain access groups if you've ever used those. You say that, hey, this target has is part of this app group, and this target is part of this app group as well. And then at that point, with those entitlements, those two targets can talk to either a shared container, which is basically a, a shared directory on the system, where you can store files, or you can uh, dumb it down, for lack of a better word, to NSUser defaults, where you're dealing with that familiar API, where you're just 
writing keys back and forth, reading and writing keys in this in this dictionary like API back and forth, and they're shared between. Uh, they're shared in a way that the container app can read it when it's running, and then the app extension can read it when it's running. But like I said earlier, there's no requirement, and it's likely that your container app won't be running at the same time as your app extension. It's not required. And it, it makes sense if you think about mobile operating systems. They're, the resources are limited, so Apple has done this in a way so that the host app can run with uh, primary focus and have as many resources that, as, it, as it needs on the system. And it doesn't have to have the resources required to run the container app as well as a whole. It just runs as a lightweight extension. If you do happen to need to talk to your container app, uh, you can th use it, do that through the Open URL API. It's similar to the Open URL API on App Delegate, but again, you don't have access to the App Delegate. You'll do this through what is known as an extension context, and that is uh, provided at the time your extension is invoked. The host app sends you a context, and then that context has an API for Open URL, and you can pass. Um, you can launch your app with some past parameters if necessary. Maybe you have, maybe this app extension requires some configuration that only the container app can do, so you'll launch that container app so the user can configure it and then jump back and actually use the extension. Okay, so creating, what does it look like to actually create one of these things? Um, so when you, let's assume that you've already got an app and uh, this app is a, is a, bit, a Bitcoin price tracker, so you can see the current live price on Bitcoins. And we want to add a, a widget so that in, in the user, or in the notification center, the user can, can look at the price at any given point in time. So you would go to add a new target, and then you select the application extension group in the new, um, new in the template picker, and then you would select today extension. Right now I've got, in the screenshot, I've got action extension selected, but you actually select today, and you say next. And when you press next, it asks you a couple of other questions. How do you, what language do you want to use? Um, and then what app this extends or what target this extends. But eventually you'll end up with a new, a new group in Xcode. And this is the uh, layout for a today extension. It creates a new, a new group, has one uh, Swift class in there, one storyboard, and an info plist. So let's take a look at actually um, what the what that looks like in Xcode. So I've got this open here. Um, you'll see, if, if like the screenshot showed, we've got this BTC widget group, a today view controller, and a, uh, a storyboard. So off the bat, it probably makes sense to design your storyboard. So if we open the storyboard, we'll see here um, that we've got it's a pretty simple view. We've got this price. This is our current price. We've got a change in the price from yesterday. So the price has gone up a dollar and twenty-three cents. And then we've got this little button here that's going to toggle to make this this widget expand and contract. So when I expand it, this is actually a line chart that's going to show the price history. So let's um let's just see this app running itself. So this is the app. Uh, Bitcoin's not doing so well today. It's dropped down to four hundred sixty-eight dollars, and it dropped a matter of seven dollars between right now and yesterday. And this is a line chart, and you can drag your finger across it to see the price history. So we see it used to be five hundred twenty-five, and now today it's all the way down to four sixty-eight. So how do we wrap this up into a, a, a widget? So we we designed this view here. Like I said, we got it's all it's just really squished down view of this um, in the notification center. So a widget acts as just a view controller. Uh, currency data view controller is a subclass of UI view controller that provides some shared functionality between our widget and our, our view controller we're seeing right here. And it's, a, it's, it's really pretty basic view controller that you're probably familiar with. You, you've got the view to load. We've got some, some, some methods here that happen when the button is pressed. Um, viewed it appear does some certain things, like it goes and it fetches the prices. Some layout stuff. And now we get into some of the extension things. So this widget margin insets for proposed margin insets says how you want to position the content of your widget. By default, um, Apple pushes everything over by about 20 points. 
and that's you'll you'll notice that in their in their widgets they kind of have this margin. Uh, for ours, we wanted it to sit all the way to the left, so we just set it to zero. And then um, the system might uh, frequently call your widget to make sure it's updated. So you get this this call this call from the system um, when it wants to update the view. It says perform update with completion handler. So here we're just again fetching prices and then updating all of our our view. You're responsible for calling their completion handler that they pass in with a status. So in this case, we're saying, yep, there was new data, um, so we're done, and there was some new data. Otherwise, you say, no, there was no new data, and we're, well, we're done. So you're just you're responsible for saying when you're done doing your updates. So for the today extension, I mean, this is this is it. We've got these two overridden methods for the protocol, and the rest of it's just a plain old view controller. With a lot of the functionality is is wrapped up in this parent view or this super view controller. So let's see what it looks like. We'll switch to our BTC widget scheme here, and when we press run, it's going to look a bit differently. It's not going to launch the app like we're used to. You're, you're going to see this options here to say which app do you want to run. So as you know, an extension is usually invoked by some other app. If you were doing a share extension, it would probably make sense to launch photos so that I can try out my share extension within photos. But for a widget, we wanted to launch the today view, which is the notification center. So if I open the simulator here, so this is right next to us, and I say run, we'll watch what happens. It's building up here, it's deploying, closes my app, and then the notification center slides down, and there's my widget. And it's going to update because I ran it earlier. But now it's it's showing the price that we we saw, or more or less, from the app, and then the change, and then I can tap this and expand it to see the line chart. On this one, you can't swipe the line chart to see the price history throughout the throughout the the past 30 days, because as you notice, when I dragged my finger here or the mouse, it's switching views. So you'll have to design your extensions in a way that don't cause problems like that, so we just disabled that feature for, for the widget. Um, and there's just some limitations here and there throughout, but the book kind of explains some of those, and then Apple's guides explain the rest. Let's jump back to the presentation. There's not much left here. We'll get to Q&A. So some resources. I mentioned a couple times our book. Uh, we've got all six extension types implemented in there, step-by-step -step tutorials. And then um, we've, I, I highly recommend if you're going to do any app extension programming to go through Apple's guide. Uh, this URL is going to change because it's still pre-released. Probably it's going to change tomorrow or the day after. But you can Google app extension programming guide and it's probably going to pop up. And I highly recommend going through that. And that's that's all for the presentation. Let's go to q and I think Ray's got some questions. Lined up. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. That was awesome. I thought it was a really nice overview of all the different types of app extensions and you know how they work. And I like the examples you gave too of some what other people are doing. That was kind of interesting to see that. So thanks again. And um, so now we're going to open things up to Q and A. So if you're watching this live, feel free to keep the questions coming and upvotes too. And I'll just go through them in order. And uh, some of us might have some questions too along the way. So we'll start here with the first question from Ben Munge who asks, is there any way to create action or share extensions on data types not exposed by Apple? For example, he'd like to create an action extension on a map coordinate but doesn't see any clear way to accomplish this. Um, so if you're within the Google Maps, or the, sorry, Google, I'm still stuck in iOS 4. <laughs> if you're within the Apple Maps app, uh, you can, I, I don't think there, there's much as far as, the extension goes there. I'm just going to open the app and see if you can even... They do have the share button, but um, to be honest, I didn't play with that. They have some actions down there. I suspect when you... If your extension were to say that it supports this type of data... You did, so that's a tricky one. I don't know what data the Apple Maps app is pushing to its extension or what, what it expects. It looks like you can tap into this but, like I said, 
Um, when you write your extension, you have to say what type of data that you support. So if, you, if you're a share application, you say that, hey, I support one image. And um, your app extension will appear in that list, or your action extension will appear in that list when that criteria is met. So um, there is a way, it's, and by default, when you create your extension, Apple has this um, predicate language, and they just say true for everything. So when you're developing your extension, it will show up in every app, regardless of what the data type is. So I, what I would do is create that extension, um, see if it, if you can show up in the, in the Apple Maps app, press the invoke it, and then set your debugger inside of that first first method that gets called and see what that context looks like to see what that data is. And at that point, I would just kind of reverse engineer it. Um, the documentation is uh, unfortunately a little bit lacking for some things, but that would, that's the approach I would take. Okay, cool. Um, let's see here. Uh, the next question is from... Martin Markov, and he's asked, has Apple provided any document provider examples in any of their apps, like in Mail or Numbers, or have you heard of anybody doing this in general? So the document providers, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, like we saw in the, in the keynote, Box.com is one of those people. Uh, I assume Dropbox is going to be there as well. OneDrive from Microsoft. As far as Mail and Numbers, Mail seems to be just Mail. Like, I was really... Um, disappointed that I don't see any way to invoke an action extension within the mail app. And I think that's mail is something you action on all the time. Like maybe I want to add this message to my to-do list, but unfortunately I don't see anything like that. I did support, did submit a bug report or feature request for that. Maybe we'll see it later. Uh, numbers, I would highly expect that numbers is going to support pulling the documents from other document providers. And I would think it would work the other way. But again, I haven't looked into that myself, I, but that's the ex exact app that Apple's kind of targeting with document providers, is anything that manages some type of document. So I would be unimpressed if they didn't support it. <laughs> uh, and um, Mike Katz, who's another tutorial team member, actually wrote a chapter in iOS 8 by tutorials that explains how to make a document provider extension using uh, Amazon S3, which is kind of a neat example. Uh, okay, the next question is from Tim Mabbitt, and he says that the app extension programming guide says that a widget can also appear on the lock screen of a iOS device, but he hasn't found a way to actually be able to make a today extension show up on the lock screen. So he was wondering, Chris, if you've looked into that uh, or you know that's coming in the future or, or what's going on with that. I don't recall having an issue with that. Um, as far as just like the documentation says, yeah, it should be showing up there. I would, exp I, I would think that you're just running into some some bug. Um, I, I assume you're on GM. If you're not, I highly recommend going to that because they've gotten a little bit better. But this has been a, a really bumpy road writing these extensions. And to be honest, I'm not surprised to hear that it's just not showing up for you. We even saw, I saw a tweet this morning saying that extensions just aren't working at all in the App Store. Some apps have actually been updated to iOS 8 and include them, and they're just not working. <laughs> It might be a little rough road for us here in the first few weeks, but so to um, clarify, to clarify, Chris, you've actually seen an app extension working in the lock screen. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think that you're just hitting a bug or something. Okay. This actually leads to a question that I had, Chris. Um, you know, you've been working on a lot of these app extensions for the book, so I'm wondering what sort of tricky bits or gotchas that you might have encountered working with extensions along the way. So a lot of them Apple has addressed in GM, thankfully. But the biggest got, I mean, the biggest problems were debugging. And now uh, we showed it in the in the demo there. When you to debug your apps or your extensions, you you pick you, you pick the scheme and you press play, and then the debugger is going to attach to it when it launches. So that's that was the biggest thing. It was like it was back to old JavaScript debugging days where you're just logging everything to see what's going on. But um, yeah, so to clarify on that, Chris, if I understand it right, when you're debugging an app extension, you you go to debug and you choose what app you want to host your extension, and it launches that host app, but it will stop at your breakpoints inside your extension, right? That's correct. That's that's as advertised, and I did I have seen that work really well in GM. Okay. Um, as far as other gotchas, 
I think just understanding that those extension contexts and what type of data is being passed, like we talked about with maps, um, unfortunately, there's not clear set instructions on what type of data structures are being passed from certain apps. So you just kind of have to crack them open the, in the debugger and and do some 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 print logs and see the see what's actually in there before you start consuming it. Um, I would also highly recommend looking at one passwords implementation for their library. They've basically defined their own type of data that um, the the host app receives, and they've done it in an interesting way. So I would check that out. It's open source, and you can see how they're using action extensions to, to ma manipulate a, basically a custom data structure. Um, other gotchas, just be aware of the limitations. Um, like one that, that pops into mind is no, or widgets can't use a keyboard, so don't expect your users to be able to type in information into widgets. Uh, just be aware of what the, the limitations are before you start developing so that you don't shoot yourself in the foot. Um, okay, hey Chris, I had a question, um, but you kind of already answered it uh, earlier, and it was can apps, uh, or can the extensions make API calls, which obviously it can after talking, but what are kind of the limitations on, you said there can't be long running processes and things like that. Um, so when you're like uploading images, is there kind of a timeout where it fails, or how does that work? Yeah, so you have to use the NSURL session background configuration. So um, you, you create the task, the NSURL session task, and um, you say, hey, this is a background task, and the system will run that in the background after your extension's terminated. And then when it's finished, your container app will be called through the callbacks that are there today. So if you're if you've ever done background transfers in iOS 7, um, it's the same idea. You create the task, it's a background task. Your extension is terminated once it comes back to the host app, and then it eventually finishes in the background. Um, one thing I am kind of disappointed with with share extensions is there's no clear-cut way to let the user know that it's finished because this thing is a long-running task, and you've gone back to the host app, and it's like, you're kind of in this state of limbo where you're like, did it actually do anything? So um, I'm curious to see how people are going to solve that problem. But for my example with the imager, upload is it uploads its imager, and eventually when it's done, it's going to copy that URL to your clipboard so that you can go and share it with somebody else. But Could you like notify your app that you start in an extension and then be checking your API for when it's complete, basically, something like that? No, that's a good thought. Um, I did you just that kind of spun my gears a little bit, but maybe when that callback comes back, your container app can launch a local notification. Right. A local notification to say that it's completed. So yeah, that's something to, something I want to try out now. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Hey Chris, that was an awesome presentation. Uh, I have a two very very quick que questions uh, about some of the examples that you uh, showed us today. Uh, one of them is this uh, keyboard that you showed us with the animated GIFs. Um, that's, that looks pretty funny, but first of all, uh, it didn't really look like a keyboard. Does it actually produce keystrokes of any kind? Does it produce like any characters of any kind? Or how does it work, actually? So they, yeah, they, they did an interesting approach. I think that there's a limitation with keyboards where they can't insert um, images like media into the as a text entry mode. Um, so what they do is it's basically just a view, and there's a demo of it on their website, uh, popkey.com, I think it was. And you get this presentation of these um, different GIFs that you can pick, and you tap on one, and then it copies it to your clipboard, and then you have to manually paste it into the, the text view or the text area, and then you get it sent. So it's kind of a it's a hack, but I think it's pretty funny, right? <laughs> it's fun to send it from these. It's pretty funny, things. but as I was watching it, I was thinking, like, is actually Apple going to allow this extension on the App Store? Because I'm sure that they're going to be pretty like mental about it. Like, this is a keyboard. You can't really do anything of, but like inserting characters. And so, what do you think? Yeah, I didn't see anything. Um, Tammy probably could t could let us know more about that. But I don't remember seeing any App Store review guidelines that specifically said, "Hey, your keyboard has to actually be a, a QWERTY keyboard at, at the minimum." So. It'll be interesting to see. I think that we're going to see a flood of keyboards. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. And another one, just quick about your opinion, because uh, maybe you have a better view on this than me, because I didn't really look into extensions at all so far. Um, it's pretty cool that there's you can actually edit your photos uh, from the Photos app, because I personally really like to play with photos, and I have about maybe 20, 30 photo editing apps, and they all of them do certain stuff better and some certain stuff really bad, because they focus on some on one thing. And so, do you think that um, actually all those applications are going to soon offer extensions so that people would actually do their photo editing from the Photos app? What do you think? I highly expect they will because it's just another avenue for them to get noticed. So, the more people use your app, on whether that's through an extension or directly, the more likely they are to tell their friends. So, I, I'm expecting companies like Instagram and uh, Snapseed and all these uh, really cool editing apps to be available right there in, in Photos. Uh, Apple does say to keep it pretty tightly scoped. So um, I'm trying to think of an example, but if you if you had a photo editing app that does numerous things like crop it and then draw something on it and this and that, um, I think that their suggestion is, hey, let's keep this this scoped minimal so that hey maybe it's just a crop or maybe it's just a filter or maybe it's just adding a mustache things like that. Um, the I so we'll see we'll see what people do but it's it's vague just like the app I mean the app store guidelines today are pretty vague not black and white. Thanks thanks. Okay uh, we have another good question from a tool M and he asks is there any way to get the calling the host app I, app ID so you can decide what can be done in your action extension. Um, it seems like iOS handles calling of extension, so it should be possible, and the info could be trusted, but he can't find any information on if this is possible. Okay, so you want to know what app actually invoked the extension. Um, I, didn't, I didn't see anything on that. I would be speculating if I said one way or the other. Um, but yeah, I would I would check the context that's sent in to see if there's anything that happens to expose that. Um, but but yeah, that, that's that's the only place I can think it would come from. There, is that it, that context that gets passed in when your extension is invoked has all of the information that that host app is willing to give you. So um, you could probably if you, if you're thinking about um, your own apps, maybe you have a suite of apps, you could probably hack it up by passing that data in directly through a dictionary, but I don't know if it comes for free through, from system apps. Thanks, Chris. That was, that was great. Um, I had no idea there were so many extensions out there, um, <laughs> types available. Uh, I had a quick question about uh, shared containers that you talked about. What kind of things is sort of the purpose of that? Is that sort of, um, can you keep data in there? Is that more for shared assets, like images that you want to share between your main app and the and the extension, or is it for data sharing between when you launch the app and between when you use it as an extension? What kind of things um, is the shared container meant for? Uh, from what from what I understand, it's it's meant for data that you produce. So if you produce um, something in the the host or the container app that you want to display in the extension, you you would put it there so you don't have to recreate it. Or maybe like the 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 container app downloaded some image file. Maybe you, maybe your widget is a, a comic strip and it's downloaded the daily feed for today, well, you don't want your widget to go and have to do that again. It's going to waste bandwidth. So you can store those files in the shared container and then pull them out through your widget. Um, as far as assets go, uh, you probably want to bundle those with the target. So um, if you have button images or just little graphics here or there, I would create your asset catalogs for each target and scope those down as tight as you can so you don't, you don't have redundancy or unused assets um, across the two. Okay, so the containers meant more like the documents directory, not like the yeah. app bundle. Okay, got it. Exactly. Thanks. And that's where you would maybe store a core data store as well if you wanted to access that. Okay, um, we're running low on time, so I'm just going to get one last question, which is the current top vote which is from Mohammed Shalan, and he says, how frequently can you ask the update widget to update itself? And I know you showed us in your example a, a little callback method. Do you know if, if there's any documentation how frequently that gets called or any, any info on that? So it's, it's typical Apple fashion. It's undefined. I think that they decide when resources are available 
uh, maybe you've launched, uh, you've you've unlocked your phone and you're using some other app that has data going on. They're like, hey, we can pass this off to another thread since the battery and the screen are already running. Um, it's undefined as far as when and the frequency that that gets called. But um, I did notice every time that I opened Notification Center, my widget was asked, was basically invoked, so that I could update its views. Um, so I think that it will be. It, it'll be uh, unnoticeable to the user. So they're going to open Notification Center, and they're probably going to expect a, a tiny delay to see if it updates. I think that's pretty common for any kind of data feed app. But yeah, so every time I did, I did notice every time I opened Notification Center, it was invoked, so I could I could fetch those new prices. Okay, thanks. Um, so that's all the time we have for today. So thank you everybody for coming uh, and. Uh, but most of all, thank you to Chris for putting together this awesome tech talk, especially considering how busy all of us have been getting ready for the iOS 8 launch just around the corner. So big thanks to Chris. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. You're um, the best. <laughs> and uh, the... If you didn't know already, the iOS 8 launch is tomorrow, and so we have a big surprise ready for everybody related to the iOS 8 launch, so be sure to check back to our website tomorrow to see what's in store, and be sure to come hungry. And uh, last but not least, we have these Tech Talks every month, and we'll be announcing what's going on with the next Tech Talk soon, so just check out the sidebar of the site for an announcement and a sign-up link. So thanks again, everybody, for watching. I hope you enjoyed this Tech Talk, and we'll see you next time.